Yeah, so lots of challenges. There are similar, similar throw at all times. Speed keeps going faster. Everyone keeps wanting to do things faster, faster, faster. Power keeps going down, down, down. So you have less power available to do things even faster and faster than before. So with that comes all kinds of challenges. So with the speed, speed increasing, you have to make sure you have to be concerned about neighbors. You have to be concerned about the materials that you're using, proximity, enclosures, all kinds of problems with speed. And with power, you have to be concerned with delivery, making sure you have adequate power, making sure your margins are good, your decoupling strategy is good. So lots of lots of things to worry about with higher speed and lower power all the time. Um, we would select them and gather the material properties from our vendor, uh, which would be you guys or whoever is is uh, manufacturing our board and we would get those numbers and then put them into our software and run simulation based on those numbers and make sure they work as for selection that would again be something we would say talk to your talk to your board manufacturer and figure tell them what you're doing and see what they would recommend for board materials and based on cost like it's always a balance of cost and functionality make sure that you get what you need for what you're paying So component placement, I guess in relation to power and speed, um, would be to place things as close as you can to each other. So the closer things are together, the less chance they have of bad things happening to them, either from neighbor nets or from themselves just getting reflections. So uh, placement, it, closest you can get is kind of a general rule. It doesn't always work, and so then you need to do simulation to figure out what, what next? If I have to place it far away, how do I make sure that it's still gonna work? So for decoupling capacitors, it would be near near your power supply that you're supplying. You would just, closeness is usually key, and then routing those out directly with low inductance to your power planes is pretty important. Okay, PCB data management is definitely something that we do a lot of. That's something we're, we're pretty good at. Um, it's it's com complex a little bit. We try and make it as simple as possible, but there's a lot to be concerned about. Like where does your, where does your parametric data sit for your part data? Parametric data being things like value, your tolerance, your manufacturer part number, your internal part number, all that, where does that sit? Um, so that's critical that you have that well managed and centrally located so everybody's working off the same set of data. You're not every engineer kind of for themselves that becomes a big mess. Um, so managing that is important and then managing your design files as well. So not just your part data but your design files. So that's your libraries, your, your footprints, your design files themselves, all that needs to be managed. And in larger groups, just who has permission to access that becomes critical as well. In smaller groups, not as much, but design management is a big part of what everybody needs to be concerned with. Model extraction is um, trying to turn something physical into something that could be simulated. So an example of that would be a trace on your board or a plane on your board, something uh, that exists on your board that you want to simulate. You can't just give a simulator your board file and say go simulate that. It needs to be extracted. And what extraction means is that you're turning that physical, something in the physical, um, or in your design that it represents something physical into something mathematical. So you want to turn that, that copper line into a model, something that could be put into a simulator the simulator would understand. And it understands mathematical things. Normally those are S-parameter files. Um, which is an industry standard for just communicating uh, how signals move, basically. And how that compares to simulation. Simulation would then be compiling those models, taking them all together, and throwing some sort of signal stimulus at it and seeing what it does. So you want to actually activate those, those extracted models and see what comes out the other end. So we'll talk about ours, obviously. There's certainly other ones in the industry, but we'll talk about ours here. So the, the power integrity solutions that we would have would be um, to help you figure out your decoupling capacitor. That's a big one. Just figure out, are the decoupling capacitors I'm choosing good, or are they not actually that useful? And what engineers often do is they'll just 
usually over design. They'll over design, they'll just put so many capacitors on because they can afford it and they don't know what will go wrong if they don't put that on there. The consequences can be big. So they'll usually put too many and that's gonna be a waste of waste of components, it's gonna be a waste of space. So just how to reduce that to something that's actually workable and we have software that can help the engineer figure out uh, how many is good enough? When is the problem solved enough? So that would be one big one. The other one that, that we would have is your DC power. And that just allows you to look at your resistive losses in your board and see how much current and power is lost just on the fact that it has to travel from one place to another and experiences those resistive losses. So being able to quantify that, measure it, look at it, and determine is it okay or not is something that we offer. And that's called Power DC. Yeah, so you can certainly, power delivery networks are getting larger and more complex all the time, just like everything. And engineers have more voltage levels to worry about and where they come from and how they travel around your board. Um, and it can just be very confusing because your nets are gonna change signal names all the time too and just tough to keep track of. So we have a tool called Power Tree that's gonna help you track what that signal is. You basically say, here it is coming in on the connector from my wall to my board and it comes in at 24 volts and I'm gonna start there and then everywhere it goes the tool from there just kind of spreads like a tree and just goes everywhere and figures out where does this all go and it touches other components and that's a DC to DC converter and you can say that takes your 24 and turns it into five and three and then that becomes a little tree and so it just all branches off for you automatically so really just keeping track of that whole tree can become really challenging and is something that engineers often do just in spreadsheets or on pen and paper. But we have a tool that you just tell it where the root is and we're gonna go and get the rest of that tree for you and give you a nice diagram for it. Three FEM is 3D finite element modeling. And uh, what you're doing is you're, we were talking about extraction previously and this is a technique for extracting your, your, your physical design into something mathematical. 3D FEM is a tool that you could use to do that, a mathematical set of modeling. And it's extremely accurate. So 3D FEM, I, its focus is on accuracy. You want an extremely accurate model to extremely high frequencies. It's gonna be very, very good. Uh, the downside, the trade-off that you're gonna get with that is it's gonna be computationally intense to get that model, it's gonna take a lot of computational power to get that, meaning that you might need a, a special machine to even run that, it's just something that has a lot of horsepower. And the second trade-off is that it's gonna take a lot of real-world time to achieve that result. So it's gonna take uh, perhaps hours, perhaps days, perhaps weeks to, to get you a model out of that. So we do, again, have, have a solution. Our solution in that space is called Clarity. And Clarity works very hard at uh, parallel, parallelizing, that's a hard word to say, but making, it, uh, making parallel paths, making good use of all your cores that you have in your CPU and having them each work and then bring that work together so that you can really maximize the capabilities of your, of your uh, computer that you have with all the cores on it and get it to work hard and get those results together for hopefully a fast and accurate results. What field solvers are for is there for, again, extracting. So when you have traces on your board, you need to solve them with, uh, with field solvers. And um, there are so many different field solvers. Numerous people probably in this building here have their PhD in exactly this type of thing. It's an incredibly detailed field that you can get into just studying how to how to how to analyze this this thing that's physical and turn it into something that is mathematically a representation of that. So that's what you're trying to do with field solvers. There's many many out there at, at our company at Cadence there's probably at least five or six different kinds of field solvers you could use and uh, they each have their benefits and the benefits could be cheaper to purchase from us it could be faster simulation it could be greater accuracy and those are all trade-offs 
that you want to make with your field solver. Uh, next gen 3D field solver, um, there's not much more that's going to be gained in terms of accuracy. So accuracy is pretty much as accurate as you can get it in a simulation. So the next gen for 3D specifically is just speed because these things can take a long time to run, like days, uh, days to run. So if you can shave, shave that in half, that allows the engineer to get the results twice as fast and get moving on to other things more quickly. So really I find the, the battlefront in 3D field solving specifically is speed, just how fast you can get that out. Because the model accuracy is the same.